Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Smite Draft League Season 2 Semifinals Desk at Dusk. As you can tell by our uh, attire and the ghost story lighting that we are rocking. We're here to discuss and fuss over the latest and greatest as the season heats to a boiling point. I'm D'Lo, joined here by King Fisher and Cosmic Warrior. Lads, thanks for joining me so late in the night. How are we all feeling? Feeling good, you know, despite uh, despite the time. Yeah, feeling good, you know. It's my draft here. league. We're always putting our bodies on the line, sacrificing harder and hours of sleep to, you know, bring you the content that you deserve. Fisher, how are we feeling? I'm feeling great. Might have to go get some coffee midway through, but you know, we're doing good. We love it. Nectar of the gods, of course, very important. All right, guys, we're here to talk to Vine, so let's get right on into it. I'm just going to just leap on right into it. So we've had some really interesting sets so far that we've been playing. When it comes to the playoffs that we've seen so far. I think we've already seen some pretty particularly interesting moves being made here in the Divine Division specifically, as well as, of course, across the others. But what's something that did not go to your expectations when it comes to the first round? That could be the outcome of a set, the selection of a god, a strategy employed. Give me the deets. I mean, I think my thought goes initially to kind of these both happened in the same set, but it was the Wild Inferno, Wild Inferno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think initially all the casters predicted Wild Inferno. I don't know if any of us were expecting Eclipse to go through it around two. Mm -hmm. but I mean, they really showed up. I mean, kind of a night and day Eclipse team that we've been experiencing. I think kind of going off of that, I, I think it might have been due to the role change. We saw a uh, mental head into the mid lane. We saw a cube to face head into the jungle. It's something we mm -hmm. haven't seen this season. And I think we kind of identified maybe they weren't getting off to the starts they wanted, like we weren't kind of finding that cohesion, but it all really came together in that set. And they're looking in a real strong spot going up against Flourish this week. Absolutely. Can't agree with you on that more. Cosmic, any thoughts when it comes to things that subverted your expectations a little bit? Um, I mean, in the Sanctified v. Dark Omen game, I mean, Dark Omen's a very strong team. I think one of the top three seeds overall, but I don't know. I just expected a little bit more out of sanctified i think i think rahum is a great player i've been saying that all throughout the playoffs even for before sure then um maybe a little bit dependent too much on the hell a little bit you know just getting it bound out you're, you're really taking away some of the capability there but um i expect a little bit more from sanctified maybe potentially an upset there didn't see it but yeah that's about it that's my draft league for you, you know, always the potential for some interesting upsets. Just going to lead to some more interesting matchups going forward. Thank you both for that, certainly. And speaking of what King Fisher was talking about when it came to that interesting little comp switch up as far as roles, one thing that I certainly was not expecting, even though they, they low-key warned me about it when it came to the interviews, was that role swap between Divine Eclipses, Cube to Face, running the jungle as Sir Ket, and Mental Depressed going mid as Giannis. When it comes to late season experimentation, what do you guys think is the key to successful results such as that of Eclipse versus maybe a twist that falls flat on its face? I think the key is just, you know, practice being able to like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you don't want to do it in scrims because you don't want to like give it away. Right. But, you know, you need mm -hmm. to be confident on the picks. You need to understand why you're doing it, the strengths and how you can really do it to its full potential so i think you still need some practice even if you're not wanting to do it in scrims uh, whether you're just you know playing in houses versus other players or something like that uh, i think just getting that comfortability and that confidence down is really key to something like this because you know you, you would you know think that you don't want to you know switch it up from what you've been practicing for six weeks you want to you know just stick to your guns do what's been working but you know, we've seen teams just shake it up last minute and it's worked out pretty well. It has for sure. And I think, like you said, practice is always kind of a big part of those changes. You really got to rehearse something, run through it, make sure you know what you're doing before you make it happen. And I think the other thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is like making changes for a reason. I feel like so many teams sometimes can kind of catch themselves out by whether they're changing a strategy, whether they do a role swap just to throw the other team off kind of mm -hmm. and not really think about is this going to help us win like is this something that we should be doing just oh they're not going to expect this so let's do it and it's kind of two really important distinctions but i think in eclipse's case they made a really good change it looked strong this week it was definitely a good change for the team and i mean we're left with them and the one two and three seeds obviously their strats have been working all season and i think i mean we've talked to them in the interviews in round one round two 
in I mean, sure, they might be thinking of new strategies, kind of maybe new compositions. But if they're going to do something like that, I think it's going to have to be a change that benefits them instead of trying to put their opponent down. I think that's a really good point to make. Subversion for the sake of subversion is, I think, a really dangerous trap that some teams can fall for, where you're just like Cosmic said, you know, if you have a solid strategy, it's working out, you know, why fix a broken bridge or not broken bridge? You would certainly want to fix a broken bridge. Why fix something that's not broken? It's a good question of whether or not are we doing this because it's actually going to throw someone off or doing this because it's going to throw us off and we just want to try to mix things up. You have to make sure that you're finding that right balance there. So thank you guys for both approaching that with different uh, answers. I appreciate both of your uh, inputs on that. So continuing right along, what is one when it comes to maybe things that we didn't see executed quite as well? What is one tactical or execution wise pitfall pattern that we've maybe seen across the divine playoffs so far that you would like to see players crack down on where are just some common mistakes that we're seeing that we think need to be tightened up a little bit oh i got an i got an answer for this one this man's <laughs> I mean, ready because admittedly i don't think in divine so far there have been a whole ton of like teams making one really big mistake that ruins a set but i i have seen some that kind of I think not necessarily loses them the game all the time, but kind of sets them behind. Mm -hmm. And that's like the unorthodox picks. Like it's one thing. I think it goes back to the strategy. Like we said, to bring it out if it helps you. Uh, But there are some things that I think have really gotten teams behind. I think my mind specifically goes to the dark Omen versus sanctified set. I mean, sanctified, incredibly talented team. They have a really strong mid laner, but both games, they ended up running a double ADC comp. And it almost worked in the first game because they had some magical damage with it. And I think they stuck with that, but they didn't go to Hades solo. It was just really way too easy for Dark Omen to kind of counter that when they seen it. I mean, the CC set to the Ormond mid, it did crazy damage. But I think when we saw some breakers in that game, it kind of wasn't up to the potential we've been seeing all season you know they struggled a little bit breaking the titan i think small things like that that just kind of impact the game in a way that's so much larger than you would think it would has been a common theme at least over round one i'm hoping they get it all figured out by round two but if it keeps going like that it could really mess up some playoff runs certainly anything to add there cosmic um not really to that but there's in general sorry when it comes to general pitfalls right um I think I feel like happens a lot. Uh, just in competitive smite in general. Maybe it doesn't happen quite as much as in like the Divine Division, as games tend to be very decisive. But uh, we've definitely seen in some other divisions, even in the playoffs, where teams really struggle with sieging Phoenixes and ultimately ending games. We see teams up 7, 8, 9, 10,000 gold. And, you know, they go to the Phoenixes and they just don't execute. They, they, they They'd don't be floundering. Through. Uh, you know, they make a couple mistakes and and those mistakes add up. And just with the way the comeback mechanics exist and smite, it becomes very easy for the other team. You know, they get one team wipe and the, and the game could just be over for them. So, yeah, I think some teams need to really just hound down and, and just really execute a, a strategy when it comes to sieging Phoenixes and sieging the throne room because uh, it can definitely be a big pitfall. And honestly, I, just overall, I think it's one of the hardest things for any team to really do. I mean, we see players to be we see players struggling to do that even in the SPL. Decisiveness is such a key aspect of being a good smite player. Knowing when, okay, we have three down. Do we make this Titan push or do we stay safe, get some furies, get some objectives off the map, and maybe some more towers? instead of maybe making that final push. And it's one of the key things I think can really separate a good player from a great player. Absolutely. Hesitation can be the death of you, but could also be, you know, the key to success. Maybe if you're caution could also, of course, right. be substituted for foolishness, all depending on, you know, when, when you make those decisions. So certainly games can absolutely ride on both of the things you guys mentioned. Hopefully as people, you know, learn from their mistakes, review those VODs, those who are moving on to the semifinals will recognize okay maybe this is where we could tighten up on we'll see some cleaner gameplay and already what we're seeing was very clean coming up from both of our teams that are moving on to the semifinal or all four teams moving on to the semifinals at the moment all righty guys and uh thank you all for the answering my questions we're just going to wrap it up with a little bit of bracket recap here so looking into what we've got coming up on the waist side we do have eclipse versus flourish and dark over sunbreaker so what we're going to do here since there's only two of you guys i'll count down from three both of you guys are going to give me your predictions for each one okay so when i count 
down from three to one. I'm going to have you guys just name the team you guys think is going to be moving on to the semifinal, or sorry, to the finals. So, Eclipse versus Flourish. Three, two, one. Flourish. Eclipse. Ooh, okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear points on each side. So, Cosmo, I'll start with you, man. What do you think? Um, start with Fisher. Oh, oh, that's what he okay, thinks. Okay. All right, I'll start with Fisher. He says, "Go ahead, go ahead." So I can just start argument. I, I would, I would also think to start with Fisher. I've heard that guy's smart, but uh, uh, I, I mean, so, <laughs> causing my so, disagree after that last time. I, I guess so. I mean, I think initially Eclipse are in a much better position going into round two than I think they were in round one. Okay. I think the swap worked out really well, but when we look, and I think that was kind of what made that change, at least for me personally, they're going into Z Tan and flipping ninjas literally probably the top jungler in mid i think there's some contention in mid with evan on sunbreakers obviously but as good as mental and cube did i don't know how facing a mid and jungle kind of that caliber that has spent the entire season in these roles or team has a lot of chemistry i don't know how they're gonna stack up just because i don't think they've had enough time to play together with that composition fair points cosmic counter um yeah, I don't know. I feel like, you know, they're coming in, they're fresh, they're, they're, they're hot off a win that, you know, maybe some people didn't expect. I know we certainly didn't. They're, they're definitely writing something. They, you know, have made this change and they found success with it. So I feel like they're they're coming in with confidence, uh, even if it's a little bit of a long shot. You know, I like long shots. Mm-hmm. I think um, they have a lot to prove. And I don't know. I feel like they're going to show up and play some smite. Talking to them in the interviews, they are certainly riding high after their victory. They're feeling good after employing those changes. So going to have to see if, once again, is this a subversion for the sake of subversion? Or is that really the key to their success when it comes to being able to be adaptable, change things up on the fly? Could go either way. Going to be interesting to see. When it comes to those who maybe, you know, for the casters that aren't here, pour one out for them real quick. But we do have some inputs from them as well. We do know that Anthony looking for the next matchup to indeed be between, I believe it was uh, Flourish as well as uh, uh, who was it? Sunbreakers. Flourish for Sunbreakers is looking to be Anthony's uh, next pick here. So Flourish going to be moving on for Anthony. But I do know that both Jeering and Phoenix looking for Eclipse to take this one. So going to be interesting to see what their matchups, uh, what, how the, all the matchups fall. But for you guys, we got one more left here in the Divine Division. So Dark Omen versus Sunbreakers. Three, two, one. Sunbreakers. Ooh, okay. Can I just hear in that case, we'll, Cosmo, we'll go to you this time first okay. since you're rep- repping both. Why do we think that um, they're going to be taking this one? I think Evan's um, pretty, really, really strong in the mid lane. Um, dirty like, Yorm player. Dirty, dirty you know, Yorm I mean, player. You guys played like a Wheelix mid and just like completely owned. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> I think he's just a, a really good player. I think Cactus Arms is a great support. Um, just really good team. That being said, um, I might be rooting against myself here because I kind of want, I kind of want, <laughs> I kind of want Dark Omen to win. I'm kind of a Vogue fan. I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. Kind of a Vogue Some fan, conflict in the heart there for the bias, cats, but uh, I would, if I had money on the line, I'd probably bet it on Sunbreakers. Brain versus heart there. You can see the duality of man there within Cosmic, but... With that being said, that is it going to be our wrap up here for Divine Division when it comes to the semifinals round. Thank you all for sticking around. We'll be right back in a moment to chat about some Immortal. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Smite Draft League Season 2 Immortal Semifinals, Desk at Dusk. We're here to schmooze over the news of the second round around that corner. I'm Dilo, once again, joined here by King Fisher and Cosmic Warrior. Thank you guys very much for joining me, lads. Got any initial thoughts you guys just want to start off with as we talk about Immortal? Anyone you want to thank for being here? Moms? Parents? Um, thank myself <laughs> for being really cool and smart. All right, there you go. The Cosmic's really on his confidence vibe right now, man. This guy has been on an arc of just pure egomania. <laughs> he really is on his ego arc right now. All right, well, hey, respect, man. Gonna have to see how that goes on into Scouting Ground Season 3. Whoa. Anyway, Whoa. anyway, anyway, though, let's talk about Immortal, a match that I'm certainly looking forward to. As a close follower of the Oathkeeper's journey, is their upcoming clash, but not 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 the, not the game though, just the clash against against Sunbreakers. 
That would be cool, though, if we had Clash. Uh, between these two really technically solid teams, which lane matchup does your guys' eye naturally gravitate towards? I mean, it's hard not to say the dual lane, right? Perspective Duck. Explain. Duck versus the mm-hmm. infamous Rama, a.k.a. Remarkable Wolf, Rama One Trick. Um, two really strong players. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I call him a Rama One Trick, but we've actually seen him perform really well on other picks. We've seen him perform on the Heimdallar. Uh, I want to say we've seen him on the Ishtar. I believe it was a Jingwei, but uh, needless to say, you know, he, he isn't a one trick. If you ban away his Rama, he can perform on other picks. Uh, Perspective Duck, obviously insane. Called the Pentaduck for a reason. Incredible plays. He got that um, merch. The, the, that's I that's Pentaduck merch. I'm looking at. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, man. Kingfish, anything to add to that? Uh, I, I mean, not not to kind of piggyback off what Cosmic said, but please do, man. I, well, if you insist, <laughs> I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I gotta agree. I think Duo Lane is going to be such a standout, especially when you talk about this two eighty Cs, because there is a lot of good players on both those teams. I think Jungle in particular is a place where those two shine, also. But I mean, it's it's Pentaduck, it's remarkable. But Wolf, I feel like kind of the, the heart and soul of the backline, easily two of our most prolific ADCs in this division, and I think just naturally that's going to be a really really big matchup. I and uh, could not tell you who takes it. That's going to be a game time decision. But regardless, it's definitely going to be one of the more high octane kind of interactions we see. Very yeah, I couldn't agree more with you guys on that one. It's going to be really interesting to see the carry lane and how it, or carry lane the carries and how they interact with each other. Will we see solos on the board? Are people going to be playing it safe, playing the farm game, looking for those big rotations instead? Going to be interesting to see how it all ends up. But I do want to say, when it comes to this, actually leads perfectly to my next question. A player who really rose the spotlight for me during their set was Heavy More Diver. That man was dropping into the back line, taking 1v3s like it was absolutely nothing. Eating I'm a Monsters, eating crushes, did not matter. This guy was hungry for more. It was insane to watch. What are the benefits, though, and the risks associated with having a player that truly stands out in your roster? What's the upsides and the downsides there? Uh, are, are you talking about like having heavy war criers stand out in particular or just kind of any player standing out? Any player stand out, you're allowed to use heavy war cry as an example, but to any player that you really see is kind of rising above when it comes to maybe one really important key set or something that they just gather all the attention. They become iconic, such as Pentaduck as well. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think the immediate benefit that would call to mind is like whenever somebody has a standout performance like that, I mean, Pentaduck went like, what, eight and two on the Ashar in game one. Whenever somebody has a performance like that, I think the enemy team is naturally kind of going to gravitate towards that, whether it be bans, whether it be ganking them in gameplay. So you can like kind of expect that it's kind of a way you can counter their team without like really having to do a lot of work. So mm-hmm. that can be a huge benefit. I, I think where we really see the downside is teams that kind of actually do rely on that one standout player. I mean, like I said, I'd probably gravitate right back towards the ADC lane for both these teams, but it's just not the case. There are so many people on these rosters that can absolutely make a difference in games that I don't think on these particular teams, there's really a risk associated with that. But I think on more kind of one-dimensional teams where there is one person, two people that are carrying the sets constantly, having them stand out like that can really, really hurt like your kind of gameplay, picks and bands, whatever you want to call it. For sure. There's definitely that, you know, that risk and that balance that you face when it comes to, okay, we have a standout player, we want to make sure we do everything we can to support them, but does doing that only expound our weaknesses? Cosmic, any thoughts on that? Um, Yeah, I think I'll find... I have a couple more drastic examples that I think I can yes. look for. This one isn't particularly um, in the SDO. I mean, kind of related to it. I'm um, looking back to the SPL uh, qualifiers tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in the last game that Elion played, I know Elion is good friends with Nublet, as a matter of fact. Um, he literally caught five in high bands. places. <laughs> he caught five jungle bands. Uh, he yep. was he was an absolute standout player. He was by far the best player on his team, and the enemy team knew that, and they banned five assassins. Now, obviously, that 
severely restricts his god pool and, and makes it really hard to to find something you perform on. But that leaves every other pick open for the rest of his team. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, they ended up losing that set because Elian wasn't performing as well, and 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 so that's the trade off. It's you know if if you can just shut down one player and their team falls apart, then you know it, it, it's easy to to commit a lot of resources into doing that if, if it's going to pay off. So yeah, it, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, the balance. I think I mentioned this last time um, on a desk before, just, you know, that sort of chess aspect uh, when it comes to, you know, comps and, 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 and rosters and, and that sort of thing. And like you said, standout players compared to the rest of the team. So there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, balance is all there is to it. You know, you always have something that com- must come up, something must come down. You have to make sure that, you know, you're not investing too much into one player if it's might not be the most reliable or consistent source of your victories. You have to make sure that you're doing that in moderation. You know, of course, glory can be one for all. It's a 5v5 game. You can have your standout players, but what if that standout player is not really standing up? What if they're sitting down? You know, then you might be caught out in some trouble. You have to see how it all pans out, though. We definitely don't want to say that there's any, you know, lacking players there because even the players that maybe don't quite have those carry games, they play their roles. One that really comes to mind for me is Slim. Slim is a great role player. And I've said this before in cast does a great job when it comes to doing that damage reliably. You're never going to really see them getting, you know, pentas or quadras like you might see their fellow duck, but they show up, they do the work and they make sure that they have that stats to boot. So, and that's sometimes that's all you need. But of course, like we said, it's all about making sure that love is shared because otherwise people like slim could fall to the back line, getting a bit behind could be in trouble. You have to see if they manage to make sure that that attention is evenly distributed between the teammates there in this upcoming matchup. Alrighty, guys, last question after you. So we talked in Divine about a little bit more of the, the negative side there, what things are we looking to tighten up on. For Immortal, maybe, let's look maybe on the bright side here, even though it's very dark out and in our rooms. What's one thing we saw being executed really well in this round that we want to see replicated here in the semifinals? I, I think initially, I kind of gravitated towards the team comps themselves and like the gods they were running and every single immortal team the one this week it was in my mind uh, pressure everybody in their team comp brought pressure i mean if we look at uh oath keepers specifically they had stuff like the circuit the vimana the odin the terra mm-hmm. so so many picks oh, that that absolutely ooh, i know right <laughs> oppressive when they're ahead and then on the flip side from a i mean king slayers you have stuff like the martikaris the vimana again the dodgy just mm-hmm. so so many gods that are so difficult to deal with if you're really not prepared for it not going in with the right mindset so i think if any of the teams can continue continue drafting like that put that pressure onto their opponents literally only good things can come from it causing anything to add there it's a good positive attitude there from fish um, you know, one thing that, you know, really stands out, uh, just from like, you know, ranked to like any form of competitive, but even just differing from like, you know, divine or immortal division is just the impact of rotations specifically. I think I want to like emphasize just like rotations from the solo lane to get uh, early gold furies. I think heavy mm. prior does that really well. Yes. Uh, you see him teleporting in. Uh, consistently to to get these these gold furies and you know while you might sacrifice a wave or two if you end up getting the gold fury if they try to contest and just because you have a numbers advantage you are able to get a few picks as well then that is absolutely worth it and and just gives yourself a nice solid lead a nice solid footing to stand off of and just allow yourself to get into a position where you can snowball and and ultimately win the game you know a little more more niche more specific than what fisher was going for but in, you know, it's just those kind of things that, that really, really matter in the in this competitive setting. Niche or general, man, it's all valid. Thank you guys both for your perspectives on that one. All righty, continuing on into just the, we're going to wrap it on up here with bracket picks. So I'm going to, of course, as we did before with Divine, I'm going to just give you guys the matchup. Three, two, one it. We're going to see if we agree, see if we disagree and talk about it. So we have Kingslayer. Well, Kingslayer's in the finals. I'm a dummy. We have Kingslayer's in the finals. They're going to be going up against potentially either Oath Keepers or Sunbreakers here. So comes oath keepers for sunbreakers i got three two one oath keepers oath keepers oh Ooh, okay we're both on the same hoping, both was hoping for some clash <laughs> both on the same side yeah when it comes I mean, to I mean, not present what are we thinking about when it comes to oath keepers why are they in the dub 
So I think initially I'm tempted to say Sunbreakers because I mean, they're the number one seed for a reason. Like they performed incredibly well this season. They're all incredibly talented players. But when I kind of look through the match results, and I think this is something I talked in Divine as well, when we looked at the matchup between Eclipse and Flourish, when you look at Sunbreakers match history, they have different players rotating in, playing different roles. And it's not inherently a bad thing. I mean, they performed well on all of them. Just kind of the lack of not necessarily cohesion, but kind of like familiarity. Yeah, yeah. Familiarity, like kind of what you're used to running, anything you want to call it. I'm worried that whatever they end up running for this game, whether it be their normal comp, something a little bit different. I mean, Oathkeepers have kept their same roles, same play styles the entire season around. I think personally that their chemistry, and we've talked about it before, is just miles above everybody else in this league. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them win. Do you got to say those Sunbreakers have absolutely every opportunity to win? They're an incredibly talented team. For sure. Their chemistry is really good. Uh, you see in the chat gooning it up. Those guys, good. those guys are goons, bro. Those, those, those Oath Keepers are goons. Cosmic, what you got, man? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, Fisher brings a great point with the. You know, just the coordinations they have, and, and that's kind of the point I was going with. It's it's hard to look at any individual matchup and say, yeah, these guys are just better. These guys are just better, and then they're gonna win because of that. But I think just the map presence that the team has. I mean, I mean, you cast at a game where I think Cosmic just like re- just just walked to the solo lane and then like walled off the Achilles ult, and then just like Yamir. Oh yeah, that was, that was yeah, that was. I think that was the regular season, right? That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. They've done, they love to do that kind of stuff where they have mass rotations. It's awesome yeah, to watch. I think their rotations, just their map presence is really strong. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, Warcryer loves to get active on these Gola Furies. I think that can make a big impact. But uh, once again, agreeing with Fisher that Sunbreakers can absolutely just, I mean, you know, we could see a 2 0, and I, I wouldn't be by either team, and I wouldn't be too surprised. But um, yeah, I, I, okay, maybe a little bit. Honestly, I expect I expect a, a win from both teams here, but um, that would be great to see. Uh, yeah, I think I don't know. I just I just like Dark Allen a little bit. Might be a little bit biased that I've I've seen them play a little bit more, but um, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, Oath Keepers for sure. They do great with momentum too. We saw you know they took their set two zero, even though they were facing very formidable opponents like Defied, who they had previously lost to yeah. in a uh, three game set. So kind of see if they can carry that momentum forward to bringing themselves another victory in the semifinals round. If we look to our friends who are not currently present at the moment, Anthony had down Oath Keepers, but Phoenix actually had down Sunbreakers. So hey, Sunbreakers, by no means you unsupported here. We still at the casting team, still very much looking forward to seeing what you guys bring as well to these semifinals playoffs sure. uh, rounds. So with that being said, guys. Guys, we are out of time when it comes to the Immortal Div- uh, Immortal Division. We're going to see you in a moment to talk about some godlike. Catch you in a bit. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Smite Draft League Season 2. Godlike semifinals. Desk at dusk. Close it on out. We're here to dive deep and go to sleep with the second round around that corner and 2 a.m. fast approaching. I'm d joined here once again by King Fisher and Cosmic Warrior. Gents, appreciate you staying up with me. How are we feeling? Feeling tired, but feeling good. Cosmic? Feeling nice and sleepy, but hey, that's when I'm, that's when I'm most alert. That's when I'm most, my mind's working the most, you know? There it is. Makes sense. Perfect sense. That is exactly how biology goes. We're going to see, though, talking about which teams about to be put to sleep here. Speaking of sleeping. So for some of these godlike games, just to get right into it, I have seen, interestingly enough, top meta threats that I have never seen throughout the regular season be making it through in the season of hope, at the very least, make it through the banning phase. And they're getting in first game I ever saw here. Flourish for Sunbreakers, we had a hell versus Aphrodite in the same game. We saw Bakasur in the game right after that. When we're talking about players that have thousands of hours into this game, is it wiser to ban out the meta staples, or is it better to lock away the comfort picks that they have 12 stars on? I, I think like in most in most cases, I talk about banning out comfort. A lot of players, it just looks so much more comfortable on them. And I think the story can definitely be the same for Godlike. I mean, no matter what skill you are, you're going to have a character or two that you just feel great on no matter what. But that being said, these are GM players, SCC players. 
if you leave them the meta picks and focus on comfort bands, they know how to play them better than anybody else in the world. It doesn't matter if they don't like the pick, they're going to perform incredible on it. I think it's like one of the few cases I would ban meta over comfort. What do you think there, Cosmic? I kind of always prefer a meta. I always prefer meta ban in 90% of scenarios unless someone's just absolutely absurdly cracked and you just can't respond to it and it's causing too much trouble. But with the way the meta is right now, with how strong certain picks are, you know, your Cernunosis, your Vumanas, it's mm-hmm. just it's just hard not to prioritize the meta bands. You know, you know, a lot of times it's you know, you, you know, you leave your box or opens, but what did you ban? You banned the Mercury, you banned the Thor, you banned the Susano. Those are all meta bands. And, and it's just so many strong options right now. And just a lot of these picks are both meta and comfort picks for these players who have that's true you know thousands and thousands of hours so you know it's hard to just you know pick and choose just one without letting something through you know it's not it i feel like it, it just matters a little bit less i don't want, I want to say like it matters less but um they're gonna be able to play something and and they're probably gonna be able to play it well at the end of the day that's a very good point i, I think it's it's so dangerous when it comes to ban because every time i see a ban or pick some bands uh phase of a game it feels like you remove one option off the board but it only makes two more even worse options in my mind like available it seems so inevitable it seems so difficult when these players are so good at piloting so many different gods with different play styles it's really difficult like cosmic said with people with such a deep bag to you know try to you know stop stifle it in any means it's difficult for sure so it's all about you know making sure that you understand your opponent and whether or not you can get that overlap because like you said cosmic if you can overlap comfort as well as meta that's two birds one stone you're on your way to a solid picks and bands phase are there any you guys think then speaking of comfort picks though are there any comfort picks that maybe are not necessarily super far super rogue super outside the meta but that you really do think in this godlike division really do warrant some attention in that p's and b's i see a finger up from fish i think i think there's exactly one because i think most of the comfort picks these guys have are pretty close to the meta like i i don't think i've seen anything that's really shocked me that being said, this is still kind of a meta one, not pure comfort. Go ahead. I Ratmilk's Thanatos has to be banned. It's I, it's it's the only one I think in the division that I would ban first every game. Doesn't even need to be a discussion. Dang. I mean, sol- solid praise. We've been speaking it and singing it the entire season through. Playoffs is no different. You can see that Rat Milk's team's moved on after all for a good reason. So Thanatos might be something to look at there if you're stocking up against that team. So then speaking of Dark Omen, let's talk about them. During their game against Eclipse, we saw a surprisingly underwhelming performance come out from Omen to start it out. Game three, Eclipse really had them against the ropes until they managed to pull together members of Dark Omen and mount a legendary comeback. Do you guys think we're seeing cracks in the Dark Omen dynasty, or do you think that this is only them not showing their entire hand? Uh, do you want to go first, Cosmic, or do you want yeah, me Cosmic, to take come it? ahead first if you don't mind? Ooh, sure. Um, yeah, it's it's tough to say completely. Um, I want to say that you know, like the, these players are just super good. You know, maybe they they had a little bit of a slip up. The, the main thing that I'm looking at uh, above all else is their you know the fact that they had a recent role swap right or not not a role swap they had like a new player uh on their team and that's what's really standing out to me but what's interesting about that is the new player was you know one of the more impactful players i think uh in the game that ended up the comeback or, or maybe i'm going to confuse with, with one of the other games but you know they went big and uh, when it really mattered and they, they stepped up and improved but you know there were some games where you know, maybe they didn't get a pick that they were they were really the most comfortable on, and that just combined with the fact that they don't have as much experience, as much coordination, and just synergy with the rest of their team compiled onto it made made them perform a little bit worse. Uh, you know, other than that, um, I don't really see you know the, the, the a big reason why you know that they wouldn't be performing well, other than just the fact that. Their opponents were good. I mean, they they were fighting Peg Veer and just really good players. And you know, you know, first seed, you know, being, you know, Rat Melk, who has been just freaking 
I can't even think of a word here, but just been praised consistently by casters and by, you know, players all around, you know, that only does so much for you. You know, these other players are just as good. These other players, uh, you know, show up and, and they come to play. And so, you know, I don't think it's you know easy to say just, oh, these guys were just, you know, on the top and now they're coming down. I think it's just a little bit more of a level playing field than we had maybe initially grasped. Thank you very much for your thoughts there, Cosmic. Fisher, any thoughts you want to add there when it comes to whether or not we're seeing any flaws maybe being exposed for other teams to, uh, you know, take advantage of and capitalize in their games against Dark Omen? See, I kind of I kind of think it's the exact opposite. I mean, granted, I don't think they necessarily looked as strong as they've looked in different weeks. Mm-hmm. But when a team comes in like that, they have a pretty drastically new roster. And the fact that they went down what was it like 13,000 gold or something in that yeah. game? Yeah. The fact that they make, I don't know, what was it, three successful Phoenix defenses in a row, steal down like 7,000 gold, they come back, they turn a massive fight to end the game. The fact that they show that much resilience, especially against a team like Eclipse, who all but two, I believe, of the production team had in their top two predictions for the end of the season. The fact that they're able to do that against that team in particular, I think, shows how much of a powerhouse they are. It definitely needs to be mentioned. The set was not as clean as we've previously seen from them. But the fact that they can come out and do that, I think, doesn't show much weakness, but shows a lot of resolve. We really haven't seen them in that position too often. That's true. You know, when your back's against the wall, sometimes that's when you can really see the metal in the character of your team. They certainly did not back down without any sort of fight. In fact, they fought all the way back to the enemy's Titans. So very large kudos there. Props do certainly to Dark Omen and their ability to mount that massive comeback. Going to prove that they're not only good when it comes to the snowball, they can also mount that defense. So I think that's a that's a very fair point to be uh, had there is that you know, they're showing that they're multifaceted. It's not just when it's on the offensive that they can make it count. They can certainly put in work on defense. Got to keep that in mind. You're st- stacking up against Rat Milken and the rest of his uh, squad there. Alrighty, guys. Thank you very much for that one. So just keeping in line with the last desk segment there, favorite godlike moment you guys want to throw out for the audience when it comes to this playoffs round one that we've already seen. Um, it's hard to not, you know, just mention the game. We already mentioned that insane comeback, but instead of just going that general answer, I go a more specific one. Seeing Rat Milk Use the Thor wall to block Tegvir's Achilles. Oh, Dude, that, that was, was insane. That, that was clean. That was clean. That was clean. That's gotta be. That's gotta be. No cap. That was really clean. That's a solid moment to pick there. Yeah. Fisher, what you got? I, I mean, I, w- I want to an- answer for Anthony first off because I know he was Please. going nuts on this behind the scenes. But same set where I think Rat Milk clipped Bean Suit Bob. Uh, like a millimeter through a ball with a humbatzel to stop the Mulan backing and get a kill. That was insane. I know he was freaking out about that one. And for good reason, I think mine though, I'd have to look at the Sunbreakers because they were going against a flourish team that was made up of a lot of SEC players. You know, I mean, we weren't sure if they were going to make it through that round and it did go to three games. Flourish looked good, but seeing Sunbreakers run three wildly different comps Every single game, I think, really speaks to that, like, kind of how versatile that team is, how good they Mm -hmm. are at their core. Because even when we see different drafts from team, we're really used to seeing one set play style per team. I think just seeing the fact that they can show up and perform on so many different looks, I I think, is always super cool to see in teams. Sunberg is such an adaptable team, not only in in the P's and B's, but also I love their movement. Their movements, I've talked about since the regular season. They're such an interesting, wily team to watch when it comes to how they move about the map. This is early rotation that we were talking about when it came to an earlier division. I forget which one it was, but I think that that's a team that really specializes in their communication and comms can be key. So going to be looking forward to seeing them certainly when it comes to these next rounds here. Alrighty, guys, it's going to be wrapping it on up with these predictions here. So I'm going to start off with just you guys talking about it. As always, we're going to just count down from three. I'm going to give you guys the matchup. So starting off here, we have Sunbreakers versus Wild Inferno. Three, two, one. Sunbreakers. Sunbreakers. All right. Talk to me about why. I, I, it could just be because we didn't see Wild Inferno last week. But uh, like I just said, the variability and just kind of the strength they brought in their wins I think just looked really, really strong. It's going to be hard for any team to overcome that. I mean, Wild Inferno, certainly a capable team. They got a really stacked roster, but I think momentum plays a part too. And after one like that, it's really hard to vote against uh, Sunbreakers. Teddy, bro. 
Yeah, Teddy. I'm a Teddy enjoyer. Teddy. I'm a Teddy enjoyer. <laughs> Call me a Teddy enthusiast. <laughs> and I like how uh, Emoji Daddy changed his name from Emoji Daddy to Emoticon Father. That just that just that just hits for me. Just showing that they're willing to adapt in several manners. There, like I said, these guys are very very willing to you know evolve with the time. So certainly appreciate that as well from the mid laner there on Sunbreakers. Excellent job from both teams. Hopefully, you're going to be seeing how that stacks up. But when it comes to <clears throat> What we see here from um, our other casters not present currently, we do in fact have Phoenix and Jeering both looking at Sunbreakers to take this one. So Wild Inferno going to have to see if they can prove them wrong. Going to be interesting to see how that all stacks up. So uh, moving on to the final uh, uh, pick between these two, uh, between these two sets, we have Dark Omen and Kingslayers. So once again, I'm going to three, two, one, three, two, one. Dark, Dark Omen. Omen. Oh, okay. Agreement this time. So this time I'm going to toss it to Cosmic first. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, you know, Dark Omen, you know, we've been hyping them up consistently. They had a great comeback and, and just, I mean, even in that set, the, the game they won was really strong. Um, They just have been looking great all season. And I think the opposition just, you know, we haven't really seen quite as much uh, from them and it's, it, I think Dark Omen is just a safe pick. You know, I'd love to see an upset just completely throw most people's brackets out the window. But uh, Dark Omen, I mean, they're just the safe pick. Fisher, anything to add there? I, I mean, not only is Dark Omen the safe pick, I, I mean, I think a lot of us expect them going to the finals for good reason. They're a really talented team. I think on top of that, Kingslayers have like interesting god comps sometimes like not necessarily bad by any means but they can sort of stray from the meta i mean the hachimon the gebs the horuses really stand out to me you know not not necessarily bad picks in any right but just some that kind of aren't you know at the top of the game and i think dark omen consistently plays picks that you know they're top pick top ban and they're like that for a reason and i think if kingslayers Continue to go with that strategy, which by all means they should. It's been working for them. They're the number two seed for a reason. Mm-hmm. I just think that in that picks and bands, Dark Omen's going to get an inherent advantage. And we've seen what that team can do with any sort of one. Kingslayers definitely have the potential to win, and it'd be really cool if they did. But I, I think Dark Omen just has to have my vote. Sounds like Kingslayers got some to prove to us casters here, but looking forward to seeing certainly how that matchup pans out when it comes to these semifinals. All right, guys. And with that, we are out of time. Big thank you there to Kingfisher and Cosmic for joining me today. Swipe, swapping some light stories very late into the night as we launched into the godlike and divine and immortal semifinals in the season. I'm D'Lo. Thanks for watching us here at the desk, uh, desk at dusk. Man, you can really see how tired we are. And we'll see you all next time for more Smite Draft League Season 2 content. Keep an eye on that Discord. We'll catch you all later. Peace.